So my name is Brian Aker. I've been working on open source for uh, a couple decades now, I think. A uh, bunch of different projects, a bunch of different pieces. Uh, for the last two years, uh, this is something I've actually been uh, spending my time on at HP. So and it kind of gets to the question of people ask me, like, so this will come up of, uh, oh, slide's missing. So who is HP? So you know, why HP in the first place with regards to this? Don't you guys build printers and stuff? Well, the thing to know about HP is that if you go back in a little time, HP was the company who actually indemnified Linux against Go. I don't know how many of you in the audience can remember that, but there was a period of time when you know, uh, Linux was going and going pretty nicely, and then suddenly SCO stepped in and you know, started to threaten everybody over patent and issue. And so, copyright. So the, uh, at the time, HP looked at the market, kind of sat back and said, you know what? This is a market that needs to exist in the future. So they broadly did an indemnification that covered like Red Hat, it covered um, SUSE, it wasn't just about HP and exactly what was on an HP server or laptop. So this was something broadly that they decided to do. The end result of that was, well, today, uh, they ship one Linux server every uh, minute. So that's what we're doing today. And that's, by the way, the number that I'm like, eh, two, three people give me numbers. This probably is the one that uh, I should go with. And somebody, the, like one in 15 seconds. Really, one in 15 seconds? Mm, three of you sent me the one in the server in a minute. I'll go with that. Um, so what happened is, is that about in 2011, I got a uh, phone call, and some guys tried to talk me into coming into their offices, and they're like, we'd like you to come and see something. Uh, I want to sign NDA, and I'm like, no. Um, you'll really be interested. Mm, not really very interested. OK, we're going to do OpenStack. I'm like, really? So uh, sometime about in the summer of 2011, I went to the HP offices, which discovered there was one in downtown Seattle where they were at. And uh, they showed me uh, all these notes on a board and said, yes, we're installing OpenStack. We're doing this as a public cloud. Uh, we'd like to come work on it here. I was like, yes. Is that what you're really doing? Just want to make sure, just to be. And they're like, yes. So uh, in August, uh, I actually joined HP. Um, and then, of course, immediately you know, went to the internal site and double clicked on it and checked the, out the REST data interface and going, yes, that is definitely OpenStack. So HP had made a giant bet, because at the time, you know, Chris before talked about an ecosystem. If it was only Google running Android, it's not really much of an ecosystem. And at the time, Rackspace had you know, taken OpenStack, tossed it out, but wasn't really, you know, there was not an ecosystem at that point. There was Rackspace and what they were open sourcing. And so by HP coming forward and saying, we are going to create uh, a public cloud based on OpenStack, it begins the it actually begins the actual ecosystem around this. So at this point, 2011, uh, HP does you know, start, starts uh, letting people, uh, anybody with a credit card, sign up and use OpenStack. And at the same time, uh, you know, helps to actually start the foundation. So it really comes back to people who goes, well, OK, that's great. So what actually is OpenStack? And what is this whole stack business? Well, to go back in time, Remember this, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, Perl, Python, all that. For you know, a decade or so, this is what we've been talking about when we talk about what is you know, a stack and what is open source. This is the thing everybody has lived, breathed, cut their teeth on. Um, and there's been many, many different attempts to kind of like mold it differently. Uh, there was SAMP. You know, we had WIMP. We had all kinds of things where people would try to like enter new letters. And it was kind of crazy at the time. Every time somebody would do this, it would be like, well, that's not really creating a new stack. You're just trying to insert your product into, the, you know, into this concept. That's not a new stack. Um, and so, and I mean, there are plenty of stack based this stack made everything. But what we didn't see yet was something that was kind of truly changing, something a lot more universal. And at the time, you think about it, you know, LAMP, awesome, great. But what have we seen? We've started seeing Google. We have seen Amazon. We have seen all these companies start to enter. And where a lamp is one thing, it is something that just runs on top of it. It's no longer the stack. It is just one component and piece of it. And that right there is kind of something that should be telling, because really, like, why not have it open source end in? Um, and this was the beginning of what we see OpenStack. So we had Nova, Glance, and Swift. Nova is compute. You know, ask for a server, get a server. That's Nova. Glance. The whole component that actually supplies you know, ISOs to run this thing, images. 
And Swift is object store. I've got an object. I need it stored. I want a URL. I want to you know, fetch it again. These three pieces were the first pieces that made up OpenStack. And from these pieces, what do we see? Well, eh, you need a little more than that to actually run a public cloud. So we start to see it kind of grow a little bit. So what do you see? You see Horizon. You start to see a dashboard enter in. You start to see things like Keystone. Federated ID. This is one of the ones that, sorry, not federated, but ID as a service. This is still an extremely, extremely powerful concept that I find that very few people have fully kind of baked into their conscious yet, is that we have a system here which is actually, as a service, uh, identity. Next piece in here we looked at, we've got Neutron. The network itself is a service. Because why not? It's end-to-end. -end. Let's actually control the entire piece. You've got multiple racks, everything. You should be thinking about not just the single host instances, but the network uh, that underlies it. And now, now we start to see, you know, fast forward a couple of years, and you start to see all these given pieces now. You start seeing things like load balancing. You see database. You see you know, authentication from around counting. How do we do metrics occur? And this is just a few, messaging, orchestration. Um, today, when we uh, keep a spreadsheet on this, there are 32 discrete systems that we track that actually make up OpenStack today. And we, not everything is actually, you know, all of those pieces make up things like old things we know about, like, you know, network time protocol. How do we actually make sure time is actually synchronized? You know, we need to actually be able to send out email, send out alerts. So this is all open source, all, you know, built up. Um, but it's actually a pretty large thing. And in the, in the time of thinking about like open source, an end-to-end -end component piece like this that runs across many, like multiple systems, we've only had three, maybe four open source pieces, like open source projects that ever actually showed off this kind of scale in open source, which really brings out a need for a whole new kind of testing because, you know, you can't test end-to-end -end with these services. You need to be able to test edge-to-edge. -edge. Which kind of brings us into kind of the mentality of all this stuff. So, Open Self itself is an, OpenStack itself is actually an ecosystem, obviously, because if you have this stack, you've got some software. How do we actually make it going forward? There's what a couple hundred companies, an awful lot of people who are involved in this thing, and well, an awful lot of commits. Uh, and the information was outdated the moment I put the slide up. So, what actually ties this whole thing together? Well. We can't just you know, take these little pieces out there and say, well, you know, Swift works, or you know, Nova works, or libvert underneath it works, or anything like that. We actually have to start actually doing testing on a large scale, and much larger than what we've ever actually seen in open source. So continuous integration and deployment, CI. <laughs> deployment, not actually solved. Um, this gives you an idea from the daily patch volume. So this right here is just the volume of patches. This isn't everything that's actually going to be committed this is just where we look and see how the volume kind of goes up and down. So this is everything being sent in. Now, I think at this point we see one in three patches actually make it through. Um, and if you think about that, like what does that mean as far as like participation uh, with velocity? This right here, by the way, is the growth of the number of actually accepted commits over time. Um, so what you're seeing here is both participation at a very, very high rate. So this is more and more participation, more and more changes that are accepted, not just you know, stuff thrown over the wall. We have no idea of the quality, but the stuff that's actually uh, tested. Um, with actually, it gives you also an idea of the velocity in which this is actually occur occurring at. Um, it's kind of pretty amazing. I don't know of anything we've ever had that's been quite this big. Um, and if you're really interested in how all the testing pieces work for this thing, you should look up Zool, Z-U-U-L. Um, I'm pretty sure at this point we don't have anything uh, I don't know, I'm pretty sure Microsoft has something like it internally, probably Google does, but it's the first time we've actually seen a system where we can do batch set of patches uh, being tested uh, sa at all at the same time. So exactly how does HP participate in this whole thing? So what can we do? Well, we're a giant enterprise, so one, we can provide a lot of people, which is kind of handy. Um, in this case, you know, we supply people for multiple different projects. We supply things also things like legal. We supply things to like, you know, the CI team. We provide things for documentation. We provide people across the board uh, for OpenStack. Um, we also do some bits of development too. Um, for instance, Trove. Uh, this is database management uh, systems as a service. This is one of the things we work on that's being incubated today. Um, the idea that, you know, paths should not actually be just kind of left up uh, to kind of, you know, like, well, maybe we'll find some paths stuff. Integrated paths, 
pretty much needs to be done within uh, OpenStack. Otherwise, you end up with these really bad uh, impedance mismatches. So for things like database management service, RESTful API, give me a database. Give me a cluster of databases. Supports MySQL, supports Postgres, there's a bunch of other ones coming out, even some commercial ones that are being added. So this is one of the early services. Um, Libra, load balancer as a service. You know, load balancers. Uh, turns out you need them to run websites. Uh, so what this does is actually provision, provisions up an HA proxy and sits there, pulls it. As user comes in and needs uh, another uh, load balancer, they make another request. And what happens? They get another load balancer, feed them back in the pool. It's crazy. Like, you know what load balancers used to cost us? Uh, it, it, in slash.terms, terms, since Jeff's out here, this might make his uh, heart warm. We had two load balancers. Um, we jokingly referred to them at one point as, you know, uh, Lamborghini number one and Lamborghini number two, because that was the actual cost of the damn things. Um, think about this going now. Libra itself is providing what used to be a really high-end service at a commodity piece. And the software, by the way, like, has actually been even picked up by uh, at least one other cloud vendor. So, you know, this is one of the great things. Chris had also mentioned, like, does your software end up in competitor stuff? I well, guess it does. That's fine. Um, a few other things. DNS as a service. Uh, we work on Triple O, which is the installer. Because, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to install the software. Um, handy that way. Uh, ironic, servers as a service, something that very few people seem to understand at this point, but it's uh, kind of powerful, especially for any of you all who have ever like, spent your time like, installing VMware to only put one virtual image on top of it just because you're trying to manage that one virtual image. Well, scrap that. You think about it, like data center uh, power utilization on the planet, 7%, and you're now losing like 40% of your given uh, capacity for just putting an image on top of a machine that really only is running one image. Forget it. Um, heat, orchestration, and service. Uh, and we supply what? Like patches back to Nova, Glance, Swift, Horizon. Pretty much anything with inside of OpenStack. We have people we are, that are actually trying to uh, push package, uh, just basically put uh, patches back in. So, and the thing that I'm, you know, and the things that I, I like looking at OpenStack and kind of like tinkering with, there is so much more here than what often meets the eye. And we're really just starting to enter the age where. There's just you know, more than a few of us who have actually installed OpenStack, and OpenStack has become simpler. Like, the abundance number of folks now actually running OpenStack um, you know, deployments is, is getting larger and larger every day. So we've started seeing people actually learn more about how the tool works. So something like this. You know, here's a standard kind of deployment. Um, you've got Keystone. You've got Nova. You've got Trove. You've got Swift. You can see where Trove itself is actually um, makes use of Keystone directly. It makes use of Nova for doing uh, deployments. Actually, technically, uses Swift for actually handling where its backups are stored. You know, this is a service-oriented architecture, and all these little pieces are, uh, can be molded together to do different, different things. And this is where, like, as we see people starting to be creative, like with installations and things like, for instance, this is a, a thing we actually do. Um, we see things like we have Trove, we have Nova, but we can also create private Novas. Like, we can have multiple running Novas at different times. So in our case, what do we do? We actually have Nova running in a private environment just because we have a select set of hardware that we run, that we actually run the database as a service on. And we're finding this to be kind of a useful thing. Now, and if you think about it, like, obviously, like, the other cloud vendors are doing this sort of thing. And the architecture is friendly enough to actually do these pieces where you can say, well, I want to take a Nova here. I want to put it, you know, on top of a very particular set of hardware. Or, you know, I don't want to run with virtualization. I want to use containers. The trick we do, um, less overhead. So these little pieces allow us to kind of start moving things around and actually determine what we want with them. Um, and the architecture itself is pretty, you know, Lego-like. You can start putting these, tinkering these things together and coming up with different systems. So here's one example. And this is the kind of stuff that we're actually learning and we're trying to, you know, as we learn it, kind of pass it along to others. Um, Kind of brings up the question, like, do we, what do we actually learn from actually running a public cloud? One of the things I think is kind of, uh, one of the things I think we add that's uh, uh, us and Rackspace uh, do is just, how does this thing actually scale? Like, where are the bottlenecks in it? You know, one of the first times we ever had it up and running over, like, a certain size, um, I remember uh, watching it um, melt down. Uh, this is about a year and a half ago. And then we started going in and going, okay, why is this thing actually melting down? What's the problem? And what we found out, oh, bad indexes on the database. Let's go get that fixed. Nova had bad. So what we do? We actually put them together as patches, sent them back in. 
this is something the public cloud vendors can particularly do because we are running stuff at such a scale, and it is stuff that we are giving back. Um, you know, we've done a recent run with uh, Keystone. Uh, what did we find? Oh, it turns out that like nobody considered what would happen if the tokens built up because you were creating you know thousands and thousands of instances uh, at once, all trying to you know uh, generate tokens. Well, that's got to be cleaned up. We find these sort of bugs and we pass back that information. Um, because that's, you know, that's one of the things we can do uh, for this project. So other things. We're starting to try to figure out how to apply our philosophies. It's something I kind of push my engineers towards. It's like for us to find a common uh, design philosophy and think about what these things are and then push them back uh, into OpenStack um, so that kind of, you know, see if others will actually kind of share with some of us our ideas. Um, you know, continuous integration, it is thankfully the norm. This was a, you know, a debate. This could be a debate with folks you know, a couple years ago. Um, I came to CI, uh, the whole conclusion of CI about more than a decade ago when I had first joined uh, MySQL as, a, as actually an employee and I discovered like, so we build Windows binaries right, but we don't actually test them. So we have no idea this stuff actually works. Okay, we gotta fix that. Uh, so, you know, this something is thankfully, it's kind of like a, another thing like version control. Once upon a time I would tell audiences, you must use version control, do you know what it is? And half the audience raised their hand going, we have no idea what this version control thing is. Thankfully, that's not the case anymore. Um, SSH in, uh, into production is considered harmful. I can go into more of that. Data security encryption at TIM level, uh, and just talking about the values of open source being, uh, you know, audible. So, you know, this is one that I've been starting to, you know, that we've learned along the way, and we're trying to push push back. You know, don't allow SSH ever into your environments. No shell, nothing. You know, one of the things about Trove is when Trove is running, all those database instances, there is no SSH. There's no shell. There's no nothing. You're not going to get into those things. They are pretty little toasters, and that's it. Why is that? Well, you end up with these things where, you know, some uh, op or, or developer often will come back to you and say, well, everything was working. And you're like, but what was that, that hiccup the other day? Well, I just had to log in, and I run this command every so often, and it works. You did what? Hold it, you have to log in. What happens when you go on vacation, get hit by a car? Um, the process has to be restarted. All these things make for better software. The software needs to just work, not have maintenance. It needs to run. Um, you know, I just deleted the logs. Oh, the file system's filled up. I, you know, I'm sure many people in the audience have been a victim of, well, we had this one guy, and we never knew that like every three weeks in, he went in and just deleted these logs that have just been growing. Um, forcing people off SSH, off boxes, means that this stuff has to get fixed and it has to go through a, a CI process and it works better. Um, humans are essentially sources of bad entropy. Uh, they want human logs into a box, it's over. Uh, which kind of just forget it. Then we look at this stuff like SOC compliancy. The day somebody said like, oh, we definitely make sure everything is SOC compliant. I love SOC compliancy. If you're not doing uh, SOC compliancy today on your own systems, just do it. It has so many good, rewarding things that like forces you through best practices. Uh, and for any of you in the audience who think about debugging, like this is the kind of stuff we're trying to like push back and think about. Like, as you want to operationalize OpenStack, uh, you need to actually think more about what are the long-term pieces. Like, if you don't have people logging in, you want centralized uh, logging. You want centralized logging anyway, because what do you want to do? Give your support people shell access? That sounds like a bad idea. Um, kick the box from the fleet. All this idea. The idea that if for some reason a human does need to actually go into a machine, at that point, what do you do? You take the machine out of rotation, you let them in, and then you format it and reinstall. This is great. It means people don't want to go into the system very often because they're going to have to deal with formatting. Two, um, we do get to find out if the system is actually HA or not. Like, okay, you get access to the database. We just pulled it out of rotation. Let's see, you know, does Galera work? Excellent, it does work. Like, these are best practices that kind of get people like to, to think about things. Um, provide snapshots. Run as many things possible in the VMs. And the way that I was showing how you can use Nova, use Nova to deploy some of your services on top of itself. Give people snapshots, allow them to look at that, but don't really allow logins. And this is for what, what we're trying to do right now is when we go in the software, like how can we build out each of the services so they don't require these things in the first place? How do we make things into toasters? Um, Part of this involves like security. Um, we don't really want people logging into systems because once they're in those systems, well, what can they have access? It also means what can other people access? Um, 
this is kind of a new thought process. I'm trying to get like more open source developers to think about when we're, we're developing software right now. Like, if someone can log in, if your system requires some kind of login, you know, we have already kind of defeated privacy on that moment. And, you know, it's kind of how do we actually rethink these things? Don't think about people logging in. And really, you know, as we develop software and what we're trying to do is think about how we just do this a little differently. No one should be able to log into someone else's database. That's period. Like, it's their database. Your vendor should not be able to log into it. It's your data. You don't want them to do it. In fact, not only do you not want them to do it, you want the system built so they can't even do it in the first place. And by the way, it saves a lot of headache if you're the vendor and you're like, sorry, I'd love to give you access to that data, but I don't have access to it. It just happens to run over here on this machine. I don't know. Would you like the you know, encrypted randomized bits that exist to, for us? Uh, things like that. Um, tenant data should be visible to the owner. Like, so this is things as we kind of learn as being a public cloud operator, thinking about this piece. Like, data that is actually the tenants only make it visible to the tenant. That's actually how we should be doing encryption today. So, and you know, another thing to be thinking about in all this is something I've been pushing is like, we look at copyright, and we've been thinking about copyright for quite some time, but you know, copyright is not only a list of like, you know, did we actually, I'm sorry, change log is not only about just copyright, like, not only who did something, but I mean, for like, you know, the means of did we actually get the correct sign offs and all that, but like, when we start going back through history and we have a question about something, we can start looking at it and going and analyzing all patches and understanding where things came from. And I can tell you this is like a big deal right now for everybody who's been doing open source to go back and analyze like where did it come from? What do we think? What did it mean? What did it mean in aggregate? So, you know, this is kind of a, an important piece. Anyway, so this is a few notes I've got right now um, uh, as far as uh, us running actually OpenStack. I hope it kind of gives you a little bit of sense of like what it means for HP to actually be doing this. This is one of our big bets. Um, and, you know, for me personally, when I look at it, like, this is the next generation of the stack, you know, and we required actually having an open source one, in my opinion. And so as we go through, we have to look at, like, what are the new challenges that exist? Where is the world we live in today? What is different about it? And actually, how do we, like, go into, like, doing a set of best practices around this and make them really very secure-based system? So anyway, thank you. Um, if you've got any interest at all, like, stuff I write, there's a blog, there's Twitter. Um, I'm kind of constantly trying to like learn more uh, every day about this along with HP so uh, hopefully we uh, you know publish enough that uh, others can pick up on our lessons so thank you very much